Welcome to Career Opportunities at the U.S. Department of Education for returning Peace Corps volunteers. Thank you for joining. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Antonia Harris. Good afternoon, and welcome to the U.S. Department of Health and uh, – oh, the, I'm sorry, let me start over. Good morning, and welcome to the U.S. Department of Education Job Fair for returning Peace Corps volunteers. My name is Antonia Harris, and I'm the agency's Chief Human Capital Officer. I'm joined today by Dan Carell, a Senior Advisor in the Office of Finance and Operations, as well as by four of our colleagues in the Department of Education, who are all eager to talk to you about their experiences with the Peace Corps and their career experiences with us here at Ed. We're grateful that you are jo you joined us today, and we know that this has been an extremely difficult and disruptive time for most of you, as everyone in the world over has had to make difficult adjustments. Our thoughts are with you and also with the communities that you had to leave because of COVID-19. We know from experience that the Peace Corps uh, volunteers are dedicated, passionate, and resilient people. We know sought after once you return to the United States because of those qualities. And we're excited to tell you about our mission and our passion for students here at the Department of Education. I know that many of you listening today have the skills we need to carry our mission of fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access for every American student and we would love to discuss the career opportunities we have available here at the department. To tell you more, I'd like to turn it over to Dan Carell. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Tony, for that um, opening statement, and thank you all for joining us on the line. Again, uh, my name is Dan Carell, and I joined the department in 2018 after a career in management consulting. Uh, I currently serve, as Tony said, as a senior advisor. Uh, to the CFO of the agency. Um, just to prove that it's 2020, if everything's not weird enough already, I'm wearing my son's online gaming headphones because we scrounged around the house last night and found that these worked best. So everybody, as you'll see on this webinar, is in the same situation, working from home uh, and doing the best we can. Um, Tony said that we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our mission, and I'd love to do that uh, because our mission starts with the American student. And so uh, let's take a look at that briefly. So every day at Ed, uh, we are reminded by our work of the scale uh, of what we do. We use our position, uh, our passion, and our skills to serve 56 million K through 12 students, taught by 3.7 million teachers in 132,000 schools across America. Um, you know that those schools are very diverse. They range from some schools in rural areas that really aren't that much bigger than the old one-room schoolhouses that used to dot the American rural landscape uh, to urban school districts with tens of thousands of students where it's common for student families to represent over 100 different languages and cultures. Um, Post-secondary education is just as important and nearly as big and nearly as diverse. Uh, there are 20 million Americans involved in some form of post-secondary education, from traditional four-year and two-year colleges to professional schools, graduate degrees, uh, and some of the new forms of innovative post-secondary programs that we here at Ed have been helping to facilitate. Uh, those students are taught by 1.5 million faculty, and they're supported by millions more staff and administrators. Every American is touched by education, and about one in four Americans are directly involved in education. At Ed, we are actually only about 3,600 people, but we have the opportunity to make a really big difference. Our mission at Ed is, as you see here, to promote student achievement and preparation for global competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. The front lines of this mission, of course, are the kitchen tables of America, the 3.7 million teachers, the 1.5 million professors, uh, and our role at Ed is to support all of them, to support the systems that foster educational excellence for every American student. And we do that in a few ways that are distinctive to our agency. Um, 
Here are four of the ways that we achieve our mission at Ed, and as I think you'll see from today's webinar, um, there's more to the story than this, but here are four points I wanted to make up front. First, we, report research, we support research, statistics, and evaluation that are instrumental in assessing what works best for American students, what's not working as well, and where we have opportunities to serve students better. Number two, we enforce civil rights and privacy laws that have been a backbone of American education for half a century and are critical to ensuring access and success for every American student. We are a source of funds, so Ed is a relatively small agency compared to some other agencies, but our discretionary spending is among the highest in the federal sector. We provide $47 billion annually in grants, supporting schools, school districts, and innovative educational programming. Fourth, and finally, through federal student aid, we provide $120 billion in aid to over 10 million college students every year. We're proud of FSA's role in making college accessible for millions of Americans. Now, these are just the high-level points, and, and Ed does more than just the four things that you see here. I hope that through the stories of several of our colleagues today, you'll get a better sense of the full range of our work at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, to provide you with a bit of context for what they're going to say, I just want to show you a bit of how we're organized um, so you'll know where it's coming from. So as we look at this slide, I realize that it may not be that easy to see on your computer, and it's got a lot of detail. We don't need to dive into every part of it, uh, and please know that this information is all on our website. So if you're interested in more detail, it's certainly available there. Um, but let me just say a few things about how we do what we do, because uh, when we're looking for talented people to help us carry out our mission, we invariably need them to serve in one of the areas of our organization that you see reflected here. So let me just pick out a few things on this page. Um, first, you can see over on the far left, like any organization, we have offices that support our operations and make us hum. So far over on the left, we have the Office of Finance and Operations where I work and the Office of the Chief Information Officer. So these two areas contain the sort of headquarters functions like HR, finance, and IT that allow Ed to serve American students well. As we move just to the right from there, still the dark blue boxes, we see the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. That's one of our core operations, as you can imagine. Below that, the Office of English Language Acquisition, which is an important group for a country as incredibly diverse as the United States. And below that, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, which may be of interest to some of you with a passion for serving children, youth, and adults with disabilities. In the very center of the slide, just right in the middle in light blue, you can see the Institute of Education Sciences. That's kind of our think tank. It's a long-standing hub for research and statistics relating to American education at all levels. To the right of that, the Office for Civil Rights ensures equal access for all American students and below that, the Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development helps the Secretary to analyze and build sound educational policy proposals. Finally, on the top right side, we have the Office of the Undersecretary with three offices under it. Each of those relates to post-secondary or college in some way. So there's the Office of Post-Secondary Education, Developing Higher Ed Policy, there's the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education, which coordinates programs that are related to adult education and literacy, career and technical education, and community colleges. And then finally, bottom right, you're going to hear a fair bit about these guys, federal student aid. So that little box there on the org chart represents a very sophisticated financial institution. Each year, FSA provides more than $120 billion in federal grants, loans, and work-study funds to approximately 13 million students at nearly 6,000 participating schools. In total, FSA oversees a federal loan portfolio valued at greater than $1.5 trillion, representing more than 43 million customers. So at the risk of having maybe said a little too much about this slide, I did want to give you the shape of the organization, and it's the last sort of corporate-looking slide you're going to see from us today, we're mostly going to focus on the people that we've got on the line and so that they can tell their story. Um, but let me give you one last kind of simple view of the Department of Ed from the perspective of uh, what skills do we need now. So let me show you that last slide, and then we'll turn it over to some of our friends in the agency. Um, as you saw on the previous page, we do many different things at Ed, but it boils down to this. We always need passionate people who want to support American students by using their gifts in one of the areas you see here, 
education policy, research and data analytics, grants management, project management, communications, IT, HR, and then training and development. Um, in so many cases, these are skills that can be learned through experience at Ed. So people come to us with so many different backgrounds and experiences, and they learn great skills here with us at the agency. I've got two wonderful colleagues who were professional musicians by training and now are senior leaders in finance and operations, for example. We're privileged to have 3,600 people on board who have these kinds of gifts and a passion for the American student. They're using their gifts very well, and we're always looking for more. Now, at the very bottom, we put it in red so you wouldn't miss it, uh, is the first of a few shameless plugs in this webinar for you to submit your resume to us. Um, we would love to talk to you more about the opportunities here at Ed, and we'll repeat this email address as well later in the slideshow, so don't worry about it if you miss it this time around. Um, okay, so that's the organization level view. And the rest of this session is really going to focus on our people, uh, and we want you to hear directly from them. So uh, we've actually lined up five colleagues with five, I think, very different stories to tell from different parts of the organization. I'm excited to hear from them, uh, and so I want to uh, jump in right to it. I am going to turn it over initially uh, to my colleague, Aaron Washington, and I will have Aaron uh, kick us off. So let me just check. Aaron, are you with us, and can we hear you? I'm with you all. Can you hear me? Okay, Wonderful. so I'm I'm going to talk about five different topics, and I will let you all know when I'm switching topics. So the first thing I'm going to start with is a brief overview of my Peace Corps service. As you know, uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers uh, will talk for days and days and days to anybody willing to listen about um, your service. So I served in a town called Palape in Botswana from April 2010 to June 2012. I worked at the district AIDS coordinator's office doing capacity building. And in Botswana, most things revolve around life skills, uh, working at NGOs or schools or offices, um, trying, to, trying to promote HIV and AIDS outreach and awareness. Um, some cool things about Botswana, it's a mostly Kalahari desert, uh, but also it has one of the largest inland deltas, the Okavango Delta. So if you ever get a chance to go, that'd be a great place to visit. There's a lot of wildlife, mainly in, in the north, and two of the main languages um, spoken in Botswana are Setswana and English. Um, Peace Corps is an amazing and unique experience, and there are a lot of return Peace Corps volunteers in Washington, D.C., and specifically at the Department of Education. When I first arrived at the Department of Education, the colleague sitting in the cubicle to the right of me was a return Peace Corps volunteer from Kazakhstan. And the next day, uh, I met somebody who served in Botswana uh, a couple years before me, so we didn't overlap. But so there's a lot of great opportunities to engage with uh, return Peace Corps volunteers at the Department of Education just to talk about your service and, and meet for lunch possibly to just, you know, meet and, and, and reminisce on, on Peace Corps. So I'm going to move, I'm going to switch into my job search when I return from Peace Corps in June 2012. Um, I'd say perseverance is, is really key. I applied to a lot of jobs when I returned from Peace Corps. Um, I worked at the District of Columbia Public School for less than a year. So um, I decided, and I, I say less than a year because I, I decided to take advantage of non-competitive eligibility offered through Peace Corps for federal jobs, which, which is a unique aid for returned Peace Corps volunteers um, that want to join uh, the civil service. Uh, so it may have changed. Um, however, when I applied for my current job um, through USAJobs.gov, there was a specific question about hiring authority um, or special hiring authority, and Peace Corps was one of the select I make. And so I was able to upload my um, close of service document, and that served as kind of the official documentation of my Peace Corps service. And these things may be different now, so make sure you pay close attention to the application requirements on USA Jobs. Uh, they generally have an HR context, so if you're unsure about a requirement or your non-competitive eligibility uh, for a job, make sure to reach out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I currently do. Um, I currently work in the Office of Post-Secondary Education. Uh, the, and underneath the Office of Post-Secondary Education, there's several there are several offices, sub-offices, and so I work in policy, planning, and innovation. And I've been there for about seven years. 
uh, we develop post-secondary policy and regulation that kind of oversees the federal student aid um, programs. My team's main task is a process called negotiated rulemaking, and this process is outlined in law, and the Department of Education has to conduct negotiated rulemaking to add, change, or rescind any piece of regulatory guidance contained in the Code of Federal Regulations pertaining to federal student aid. And if you're interested in working in the Office of Post-Secondary Education or Federal Student Aid, the Code of Federal Regulations is, um, a, is a, a book that you may want to familiarize yourself with. Um, it contains all the regulations that authorize the um, Title IV Federal Student Aid programs, and so Title 34 of the Code of Federal Regulations is a, a great place to um, start your research into federal student aid. So I'm mainly, mainly responsible for general provisions for federal student aid. That really just means student eligibility and also Pell Grant policy. Um, the coolest thing I say I've done since I've uh, been at the department was each year we have a federal student aid conference, uh, about 6,000 people attend. And for I've gone every year, but for the last few years, I have been selected to present a general session, and so that's in front of 6,000 people. Like, so it's me and my colleague were on stage talking to 6,000 people. It's an experience I've never experienced before, looking out and seeing that many people in front of me. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the benefits of the Department of Education. Uh, Dan talked about our mission, and you really do come to the office every day uh, with that in mind. You see employees with that in mind every day. Uh, my team in OPE, Office of Post-Secondary Education, is extremely collaborative, knowledgeable, and love policy. And I've been able to build my uh, expertise through connections with my colleagues. And, and there's an overall sense of connectedness across offices because Sometimes the program areas overlap. Uh, the work is most fulfilling, as Dan, as Dan talked about, because we do give uh, $120 billion in financial assistance to provide that each year to help students pay for college or career school. So you're able to see the tangible impact of your work each day. And I will close out with what I'm currently doing. Um, so at various times throughout your career at the Department of Education or in federal service in general, you may get the opportunity to do a detail or um, a detail is like an internship. Um, and with, it, it can, a detail can either be within your agency, like Department of Education, or a different agency. And they're always for a finite period of time. So they will begin and they will end. A detail helps to develop and diversify your skills and knowledge. Uh, and so since February 2020, I've been at the Executive Office of the President's Office of Management and Budget. And the Office of Management and Budget serves the President of the United States in developing uh, the policy, uh, budget, management, and regulatory objectives. And also it, help, it oversees uh, agencies in fulfilling their statutory responsibilities. And so I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I will be back at the Department of Education on August 21st to resume my duties in OPE PPI. And so if any participant on this call becomes employed at the Department of Education, um, please don't hesitate to stop by and say hello. And uh, I'll wrap it up there and turn it over to Debbie. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I'm really excited that I have something to contribute. As I would say, I'm more of a newbie here. I started with the Department of Education last year, um, June of 2019, after returning um, as a said volunteer community economic development volunteer in Columbia. So if there's any Columbia RPCDs, hello. Um, I, when I first returned back, I um, am a Miami native, so I wanted to try something new, and so I moved to Buffalo, New York, so that I could work for a private sector company called Wegmans. That was kind of my MO before. I have always worked in um, business administration and operations, um, so that translated easy in my role here within the Office of Business Support Services under the umbrella of OFO. Um, so. That picture right there is with my host family in Colombia. Um, I served for my two years from 2016 to 2018 in San Jacinto, Colombia. And after I left and returned, I worked in something else for a year. 
and decided that my NCE was about to expire and I went for a career change. I never would say I wanted to work for the federal sector. That wasn't the initiative or spark for me joining Peace Corps. It was just something I wanted to do. Um, I had a different Peace Corps experience as I am Colombia and I served in the region of Colombia where my family is from. So it was something I think very special for me and allowed me to give a different perspective to I would say like a traditional um, PC. Um, here in the Office of Business Support Services, how I got hired was actually attending an RPCV fair in Washington, D.C. after I decided that I was going to take a risk and um, try to use my NCE. So there were two really interesting jobs um, that kind of caught my eye. And one of them was at the USDA for Agricultural Marketing Services, which lined up really well with my food background. Um, but ultimately what uh, won me over was the personality of Penny Mefford, my current boss here, and the Director of Office of Business Support Services. And I just felt like having good mentorships and a good boss is worth its weight in gold. And, and my previous experiences, I'm sure like many people here, you've seen in your counterparts in Peace Corps can either make or break a project. And so I decided to take a risk, even though I don't know too much about what the uh, grants processing and um, business operations. Um, the mission of my current role now is to assist maintaining the core business function, business systems of the Department of Education. So what does that really mean in layman's terms for those of us who are not like career lifelong feds is um, that I work really closely with our deputy uh, uh, acting secretary and the four division directors that fall in my office. It's a really been a wonderful opportunity because I have created a mentorship not only with the deputy acting secretary, but each four of those um, directors. And um, they give me a, uh, a different point of view to the federal sector because, I, like I said, I'm a total newbie. So I know for me, when I was looking for a job, that was very intimidating, um, making the job. And everyone seems like such a professional that um, Everything seems like such a professional. It can be at times difficult to know if this would be a, a right match for you. What you know? What does an analyst do at such a broad position? Um, so some of the things I do on the day to day is that I might sit on a couple of um, interviews for the onboarding process of any of the given divisions in the office. Um, a lot of times people just invite me to different meetings for a uh, fresh perspective, um, a different point of view. Um, as a connector, um, I improve business operations throughout my office. I bring all the different experiences I've had in Peace Corps, Wegmans, and other business opportunities and experiences I've had into the federal sector. Uh, some of the things I love about working in ed is that I've met so many cool people. I cannot honestly say that last year I knew judges, political appointees, um, as many other RPCDs besides the country I served in chief financial officers, chief information officers, and a lot of lifelong federal uh, employees that have a lot of good advice and are always willing to teach me that. Um, I think one of the most important things that I'd like to be kind of like the theme is, of my kind of little segment is that Department of Education has really provided me with the guidance to set personal and professional goals for myself. Um, especially as a newer federal employee. Um, some of my individual development plans for this next coming year is to become core certified um, and enroll myself in a project management uh, course so that I can get the certification. Uh, it's going to be a little tricky now with this whole uh, corona. I'm not sure how it will go. Maybe there'll be a virtual course, so I kind of have taken a backtrack, but they're always supporting us operationally getting time and the resources to take those courses. So if you feel like I can help you kind of clarify any doubts you might have about working the Department of Education or why you would want to work here as opposed to another agency, feel free to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn. My name is pretty unique, Iadesia Bru, so you can look it up and I can help you out um, the best that we can because we do care about the people in our agency and we want them to be happy in the work that they're doing. So I thank everyone for taking the time to hear a little bit about me and how I ended up here in Department of Education. And I'm going to turn it over to the Deputy Acting Secretary of OESE, Ruth Ryder. 
Thank you, Desi, um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really um, nice to have you here, and I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. Unlike Aaron and Desi, I am not a former Peace Corps volunteer, but my daughter um, was a Peace Corps volunteer from 2006 to 2008, and um, she started out in Guinea, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, she was evacuated after about eight or nine months because there was a coup um, in the country, and she was evacuated to Mali and spent a um, probably a month there and had the opportunity to either come home with full credit for her service um, and be in a position like perhaps many of you who have come home early, or she could go to another country. She chose to go to Ghana and um, was there working as a, um, in economic development, working with women who were doing um, batik, fabric printing, beads, and supporting the work of an NGO. So she had a terrific experience. Uh, she came back and went to grad school and is at the State Department now, and I think her Peace Corps um, experience was very valuable to her in, in moving into the position that she now. I also had the good fortune to actually hire a returning Peace Corps volunteer um, in 2015. We had an opportunity and interviewed several and um, hired one who was a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, also in an SAD volunteer. And uh, she was really terrific. She was a, an assistant to me in the position that I was in at the time. And she was, this was not her, education was not her field, but we gave her a lot of opportunities for leadership and she was engaged with a lot of work across the department and left after about three and a half years and moved into a position in international development and doing health policy work. So I felt like we gave her a great opportunity to develop her leadership skills and really prepare her for future opportunities. So very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, I joined the department in 1988. I came from a small school district in Washington State where I was a, a classroom teacher and then a special education teacher and then a district administrator. And I had an opportunity to come to the department for um, a one-year assignment. And at the end of the year, I was having so much fun that I decided to stay. So I. I spent most of my career at the department in the Office of Special Education Programs working on behalf of children and youth with disabilities um, and their families. About a year ago, I moved over to the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and it has been a really great experience. Um, my career at the department has really been focused around equity and ensuring that children who have learning challenges or are disadvantaged in some way, have an equitable opportunity for education and advancement. In OESE, Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, we administer the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And in my current work, I work on behalf of children who are living in poverty, children who are homeless, um, Native American, Alaska Native, children who are in migratory families, English learners, um, children who are involved with the juvenile justice system, um, kids who are living in poverty, uh, rural settings, kids who have social emotional issues. Um, we also administer after school programs and a very large technical assistance center project that um, provides technical assistance across the country. So we have a, a very broad agenda in my office. We administer about $26 billion worth of grants. The majority of that money goes out to states and from states to school districts to support schools in educating these children who have, have many learning challenges and need additional support. In addition to those funds, which we call formula funds, in addition to the formula grants that go out to states and from states to districts, we also administer discretionary grants, which are typically competitive. People can apply for them, and they are around technical assistance, um, providing 
support through centers, uh, support to schools and districts, and also around special projects. We have a, a number of special projects right now around um, social emotional learning and um, emergency management and a, a number of different things. So work in my office, um, there's a lot of variety of, of opportunities in my office. We do policy work where we are looking at the law and interpreting it and making sure that our um, folks out in the states who are administering the law understand it. We provide a lot of technical assistance, both from the staff standpoint, they're working with their contacts out in the states on a on a daily basis and supporting them in implementing programs to improve results for um, children and youth in the K-12 school system. We also monitor because we're giving out a lot of money to, to states and from states to school districts, we go out and work with them to make sure that they are implementing the law correctly and, and providing the right kind of support to children and families. We also, we get a lot of correspondence that comes in. Um, if, a, um, if a family writes into the department and they're the uh, parent of an English learner, those letters would come to us to respond to. We also get a lot of questions from stakes. We get questions from uh, senators and congressmen, so we respond to those. We also develop a lot of guidance. The, the law comes to us from Congress to administer and it's not always entirely um, clear and transparent. So one of the things that we do is we develop guidance to go out to states and school districts to help them interpret the law. So we're, this is all part of managing grants. Um, we also support the department's evidence agenda and research agenda and help them think about areas where we need to um, do research to make sure that we are providing the best support that we can. And then assisting families is another important thing that we do. Right now, we are very much engaged with implementing the CARES Act, um, which is, um, we in my office received $30 billion to support the work that is going on in states around the coronavirus. So we are definitely going to be looking for people over the next several months to come and help us complete this important work around supporting the, the distance learning efforts that are going on out in states and, and helping schools and, and school districts get back on their feet after the coronavirus shutdown. So um, I, I hope if you're interested in coming to the department, you'll think about coming to our office. Um, it's really a, a terrific place to work. So I'm going to turn it over now uh, to General Mark Brown, who's going to provide you with another perspective from the department. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ruth. And it was exciting to hear what you do, what what Dan does, what Aaron does, and all of the all of the talent that we've got in the Department of Education, and I will admit that I'm even learning about some of that talent and where it's been uh, through this webinar as well. So I'm Mark Brown, the Chief Operating Officer of Federal Student Aid uh, here at the department. I wanna talk to you about our why and how I think that you might fit into that. Uh, and I do that uh, from a background uh, where I think I know you. I may not know you personally, but I know the core of the business that you were in. Uh, I met folks in uh, the Peace Corps in the Republic of the Philippines. Uh, when I served in the Air Force in the Philippines, I ran into you and worked with you in Turkey. I ran into you just outside of Zaku, Iraq. So I've been affiliated in some way or another for many years uh, with incredible talent that we have in the Peace Corps. Uh, and I know that you're our face abroad. And even before I get started, I wanna thank you for being willing to do that because I know how important that is to our mission. That's also why I'm excited to tell you about what we do in federal student aid. Now, some of you, as I understand it, have worked with developmental banks, non-governmental organizations, municipalities that encourage economic opportunities. Some of you have worked to set up telecommunication networks in remote areas around the world, and others have taught in classrooms and worked with entrepreneurs and businesses. So that tells me that we are more alike uh, than we are different. Uh, you serve for a greater cause, and I believe that's what we do in federal student aid. 
uh, you are willing to be uh, public servants, uh, and that's what we do in federal student aid. And so I think we are much the same, and I'm going to tell you why I think that is true. We provided opportunities that you may not have experienced in the Peace Corps, but I'm sure you will see that there are compelling missions that positively impact people's lives, the lives of their families, and society as a whole. And I'm talking about the power of education, career and technical education, and that, like you, our focus are on those who are in most need. Uh, we are an income-based kind of organization, and by that I mean those who apply for federal student aid first do so on an income basis. And so we are helping the part of society that has proven that they need our help. I do want to give you just a slight civics lesson in how we got started. 1965, the president at the time was Lyndon B. Johnson, and he signed into, uh, into uh, act, the Higher Education Act, into law. And since its inception, FSA has been responsible for keeping the promise that Lyndon B. Johnson made on that day. When he thought, given the state of the country, that education could help bridge the divide in wealth, bridge the divide in other socioeconomic factors, bridge some of the racial divide in those who were coming in at the time from Vietnam. Now, at the time, college only cost about $1,300 a year. And I don't know how much some of you all paid, but not very many people are paying that amount uh, that, that was uh, in effect when LBJ signed that law. But at FSA now, we deliver about $120 billion in aid to nearly 12 million students every year. We provide grants, loans, work study funds to help students pay college or career school, and then raise the trajectory of generations to come. Many of our, many of our customers are first generation college students. And we've done it well so far without the support of state of the art technology, automation, or even fully integrated delivery systems. But we're about to change that, and we're changing that even as we speak, and that's what we want you to be a part of. Bringing 21st century technology and workforce skills represents a critical element of what we call the next generation of federal student aid, an initiative that we're in the midst of right now. That's just one way that you can help our students, parents, and borrowers. We're helping students achieve their dreams by providing financial resources as a critical public service. Individual students across the country, and in fact, across the world, and our entire society, you'll help us deliver it. Our customers, students, are the most the precious resource that we do, and we've been trusted with the extraordinary mission to support. Many of these students have to information. We present new challenges and opportunities to better engage with the customers. We have. Excuse me, John Will Brown? Yeah. I'm sorry, your audio is breaking up. You might want to repeat the last few things you said. Okay. So I was trying to make, you did not hear me, I'll start at this point, that many of today's students grew up in a world with smartphones, social media, and instant access to information. These technologies represent new challenges and opportunities to better engage with FSA and its customers. We have 43 million customers with a total lending portfolio of over 1.5 trillion dollars. We partner with more than 6,000 financial aid offices across the country. In 2018, we processed more than 18.6 million free applications for federal student aid, more commonly known as the FAFSA forms, and we dispersed over 122 billion in Title IV aid. That means that we're the largest consumer lending bank in the world, including the Bank of China. Meanwhile, we know that the annual cost of college is no longer $1,300 a year, as I said earlier. Now that cost is about $28,000, and that's why we're growing. Unlike many of the other federal agencies you may be considering, we have plans to expand to 1,500 employees by the end of 2020. In addition to adding staff to existing functions, we plan to add quite a bit more. For example, we will be adding a quality control function and embedding compliance staff with loan servicers something we've already started. We have nine loan servicers across the country and two additional servicers that do specialties. We also have 13 collection agencies also across the country that all work on behalf of the loan servicing portfolio. We are a performance-based organization, and we use those, those flexibilities to fairly compensate staff 
from the work they take on and provide bigger and better performance-based incentives. We also invest in training for leadership and staff to ensure everybody can be successful and grow. We continue to build stronger relationships with our customers, servicers, and stakeholder organizations. I know no matter how good our leadership is, it is difficult to keep up with the diverse responsibility and growth coming at us in an ever-increasing rate. Our customers are operating in the 21st century. Federal Student Aid must be agile, transparent, and student-focused organization so that we, too, can serve those in the 21st century style. Now, you should have a pretty good idea of our overall organization as a responsive, student-centered 21st century organization built around empowering employees and a more innovative culture. We've assembled a team of experts in technology, human capital, law, administration, finance, and business with years of services ranging from zero to 51. Employees bring valuable experience acquired here at Federal Student Aid and beyond. As Peace Corps volunteers, you have seen for yourselves the value of education and training. I'm sure of that. I invite you to become part of our legacy of opportunity through higher education, a promise made to generations past, present, and future. Your experience, expertise, and dedication will enable federal student aid to better serve its customers, impacting individuals, families, and communities. So I hope you consider helping me make those futures bright for all of those students out there. We need people just like you who care about service above self, and are willing to do that for our nation, and I'm willing to bring you on board to compensate you fairly and train you to be a part of that incredible mission. I think it would be helpful for you to hear from a fellow Peace Corps member who is now a part of the FSA team. So I'd like to introduce you to Matt Brown. Matt, will you share what you did with FSA and why you chose to come here? Over to you, Matt. Thank you, General Brown. Um, so I'm Matt Brown. I'm a management pro and program analyst in the Student Experience and Aid Delivery Division in um, Federal Student Aid. I joined Federal Student Aid four years ago this month, um, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Federated States of Micronesia, which is a state made up of four different island states, um, very small islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it's a really unique and in interesting place to serve. Um, there's 11 different languages and different states and different islands within the same state will all speak very different languages. Um, while I served, I was a TESOL volunteer, a teaching English as a second language, and I team taught with local teachers um, and helped them design new classroom materials and um, uh, helped them expand their English language curriculum. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is how many of the skills you learned in the Peace Corps are directly, are directly transferable to your job that you will have in federal government and at Department of Education. Um, so many of you had the opportunity in the Peace Corps to interact with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and while I was serving the Peace Corps, I worked a lot with teachers, um, members of my community, and also, of course, with the students that I taught. And that's really one of my favorite things that I get to do in FSA is work with those external customers. Um, I work with financial aid administrators on a daily basis. I help them with questions they might have about student eligibility for Title IV federal aid. And I also get to work directly with students and with parents. And I, I, it's very rewarding, and I really enjoy that. Um, Peace Corps taught you to be flexible. And that has been a great thing to have in the Department of Education. Some of the best opportunities I've had have come from saying yes when people say, hey, uh, can you take on this task or can you try this? Um, my supervisor offered me the chance to work with 508 compliance, which is uh, used um, to make documents accessible for people who have visual impairments. And I've really become passionate about that project. Um, and it was, turned out to be a really great opportunity. I was actually able to save my office quite a bit of money by doing five-way compliance work in-house uh, rather than contracting out. Um, through the Peace Corps, you will learn to be organized, and that's a key skill to have in any government job. Like you're going to have a lot of different projects with competing deadlines, 
and it's really important that you're able to know what you have to get done and the order you have to get those things done. Um, you also have priorities that will shift and change, and you have to be able to keep track of all your work and change what project you're going to prioritize at what time. Um, the Peace Corps also teach you, teaches you to be incredibly resourceful um, and to think outside the box. My island had limited resources in terms of paper, um, in terms of books that I could use to create classroom materials. And often, my island would just lose power. And that really taught me to think of creative ways to come up with classroom materials. Um, and that think of, thinking outside the box is really important uh, at FSA. Um, if you can think critically about a problem and think of interesting ways to solve it, you can save your team lots of time and effort. And potentially, you can save the taxpayers a lot of money. So it's, it's really good to be able to see what resources you have available and solve problems in a creative way. Um, Peace Corps actually really helps you be independent. Uh, you have to be. You have to be self-reliant and able to make the best of the situation you have with the materials that you have. Um, and that's actually going to be really important in Department of Education. And it's also going to help you be a cohesive member of a team. Um, if your team knows that you can get your part of the work done, uh, they will be able to rely on you and um, be certain that you're going to get that project out on time. Um, Peace Corps is also going to be great for all of those interview questions you'll have when you're applying for jobs. I guarantee you someone is going to ask you, have you dealt with a difficult situation? And of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> You've dealt with many in the Peace Corps. And I think you'll have a lot of creative responses for how to answer that question. Um, and one takeaway I want to say is really do take away, take advantage of that non-competitive eligibility status. Um, you know, it's, it's a limited status, at least for, for me it was. It, it was, a, I believe, a two-year status. Um, take advantage of it and apply for a government job if it's something you feel you might be interested in. Um, and if you're thinking about, well, maybe I want to go to grad school and uh, go and do federal, educate, uh, federal work later, do grad school, but make sure kind of by the time your grad school is wrapping up that you're looking at government jobs. Um, it's definitely a good edge in applying for federal jobs, so don't let it take away. Um, so good luck in your job search, and I think uh, federal educate, the federal student aid is a great place to work. Um, with that, I will pass it on to Tony Harris. Excuse me, Tony, I think your phone is set to mute. Thank you very much. I apologize for that. Um, I just want to thank Matt for his words, uh, and thank you to Aaron, Desi, uh, Ruth, General Brown, and a special thank, thanks to uh, uh, Dan uh, Carell for helping to uh, pull this off. Uh, I want to close today's, out, uh, today's session out with a couple of slides, uh, talking about first perks and benefits that we have here in the agency. Um, what you'll find is that the health, life, and retirement benefits are pretty consistent across federal government, as well as uh, transit subsidies. For uh, volunteer activities, the department matches any leave taken uh, to participate in certain nonprofit activities, so that's a great perk that the agency offers. Um, we also offer child care subsidy for eligible uh, employees. We offer a reasonable accommodation, and that's assistive technology and resources for individuals with disabilities. And we also offer uh, leave. Uh, that's pretty much consistent across federal government. And um, basically, it's in between 13 and 26 hours that you earn every year, in addition to federal holidays. And then we also offer up to 13 days of sick leave a year as well. We also offer the opportunity for parents to uh, 
um, take off to participate in uh, uh, parent-teacher conferences at school. So uh, next slide. Um, so I hope that the information uh, that you received during this session was informative. And we welcome you to submit your resumes to the email address that we have listed here. We also know that um, the Ed job opportunities are posted on the Peace Corps uh, job line. And as jobs become available, we continue to um, provide those on the uh, job board. We also um, are not going to have a question and answer session, but we encourage you to send your questions to uh, Nicole Talley at the e uh, email address that we have here, or you can give her a call at the number that we have below. So in closing, thank you for your interest in the Department of Education, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services Enhanced. You may now disconnect.